you build, let's go to the Lord in prayer. My gracious God, we praise and thank you for all our many blessings. Lord, I ask that you hide me behind the shadow of the cross. May the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts, Lord, be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So a robin said to a sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, I think that it must be they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Well, unbeknownst to the robin and the sparrow, we do have a heavenly father that cares for you and me. And the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about this in the Gospel of Matthew. As Jesus was about to send out the twelve disciples, he gave them instructions. And in the passage from uh, the Apostle Matthew, he speaks to them about not being afraid. He says in Matthew chapter 10, beginning with verse 29, he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I don't know about you all, but have you ever been afraid or worried about something? Or, or do situations cause you to be anxious? Maybe that, that's just me. Anyway, today we're going to dig a little deeper in, uh, into anxiety and worry. And hopefully we'll leave here with some things in our little tool belt that we might be able to do to overcome that. So anxiety or worry is a feeling of fear, right? Dread and uneasiness that can be normal reduction to stress. I don't know about you, but I get that sort of a little bit of a kind of uneasy feeling, maybe sort of a stomachy stuff going on. But um, anxiety disorders are conditions where anxiety is excessive and of course doesn't go away and, and it can get to the place where it interferes with daily life. So George Mueller says, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. And the beginning of faith is the end of anxiety. So today I hope we're going to leave here and that we're going to let uh, our faith be the end of anxiety. So let's take a look back at our scriptures and see if we can glean some support for which we can apply to our lives. If we go back to that Psalm 104 that we shared, uh, the Psalm, the majesty of creation. When we look back at the psalm, the psalmist reminds us of the beauty and the wonder of creation through uh, its reflections. The psalmist personifies or what? Brings to life elements of creation from depicting them as garments. He spoke about the light as being a garment uh, and then um, a cover and then the, he talked about the heavens being stretched out like a tent. He also gives animate life to the wind as messengers and to fire and flame as ministers. The psalmist ends with a vow to sing praise to the Lord God for as long as he lives. So the same Lord God that created the heavens and the earth with the command of his voice is the same Lord God who is in control of the universe today. Try as we may, man cannot tame nature, right? However, we can appreciate it, we can give thanks to God for it, and in times of anxiety, we can find peace maybe by recognizing God's power and presence in creation, like maybe what about the rising sun across uh, the ocean at, at, uh, in the early morning? How about a, a fall sunset, maybe on a field of sunflowers? <clears throat> Did anybody see the northern lights painted across the sky this week? Um, so for Mary, her, uh, I, I say, she calls it her happy place. That place, the communion with nature, is the beach. She calls that her happy place. You all probably have your place. Maybe it's in the deer stand. God has given us the gift of nature. So uh, don't forget to search for peace by recognizing the Lord God's power and presence in creation. When we go to the uh, passage from Hebrews that was shared, it reaffirms that Jesus Christ is the perfect high priest. A high priest under the Levitical law had to provide a sacrifice for his own sins and for the sins of the people. 
Well, we know that Jesus the Christ himself became our sacrifice. He became the sacrifice for our sins. The price that he paid for us, uh, for his salvation, was manifested uh, by his enduring pain, sorrow, sweating drops of blood, uh, and dying, of course, that cruel death on the harbor of the cross at Calvary. From his suffered, from his suffering, excuse me, he learned obedience. We heard that in the scripture today. The scripture uh, in, from the Hebrews passage in verse 9 says, In this way, God qualified him as the perfect high priest. And he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. Through his suffering, death, and resurrection, he paid the sin debt for each of us. Our, our requirement, of course, is to believe. We have to believe to receive. So just like we might endure suffering through maybe life circumstances or other adversity, the Lord Jesus Christ, we can always remember that he also knew pain and suffering. Through trials and suffering, Jesus learned obedience and was made perfect. We can give our anxieties over to Jesus because he knew suffering also. Let's look at the gospel passage. We spoke about, uh, last week, we spoke about the rich young rulers, if you remember. If you weren't here, that's all right. We were talking about this gentleman who had approached uh, Jesus and was speaking about uh, how does one get to heaven. And basically, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Well, at the thought of having to give up his worldly possessions, the rich young ruler turned away uh, in, in sadness. But it, what we realize from that it, it's not necessarily about giving up all of our worldly possessions but it's about what we do with our worldly possessions it's about allowing the lord god to work in and through us it's putting christ first and all that we do and allowing him to work in and through us to further the work of his kingdom so our gospel passage continues and in the next series today we have the brothers james and john and if you remember they were requesting these esteemed uh, places, these esteemed places on the right and the left hand of the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. Can you just sort of picture it? You know, they're kind of vying for these positions, right? So in a traditional court protocol, the right of the king signifies the position of the highest honor and privilege, usually reserved for the most important individuals or dignitaries, while the left side of the king represents a slightly less prestigious position, though it's still considered a place of honor, depending on the context. So, of course, we have the sons of Zebedee vying for these important places of honor, really against one another, but also what? Against their fellow disciples. What we learn quickly, as Jesus does, and so many times, he what? He turns their thinking from what might be thought of as tradition to unorthodox or non-traditional thinking. He says in verse 43, but that is not the way it will be with you. Whoever wants to be great among you will be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you will be the slave of all. For the human one, meaning Jesus, meaning himself, for the human one didn't come to be served, but rather to serve and to give his life to free many people. So Jesus is speaking about living a life of servanthood. Following that second and greatest commandment to the first being to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. That second greatest commandment is what? To love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus is reinforcing the teaching about allowing the Lord God to work in and through them according to his will, plan, and purpose. So he's informing the sons of Zebedee that, that uh, he says... Um, that leadership in God's kingdom requires sacrifice. He's speaking that leadership in God's kingdom requires sacrifice and servanthood, not position and authority, is what he is trying to tell them there. Sometimes the desire for status and position can cause anxiety. Jesus teaches that true greatness comes from serving others. This is a matter of redirecting our personal ambition. So now that is not to say that we shouldn't have personal goals, right? But it's trusting the Lord God to lead us and for us to follow his plan for our lives. Uh, it's a matter of redirecting my thoughts from me thinking to we thinking, to we serving. So I wanted to share something that I anticipated would cause anxiety for me. When I was called to the pulpit, you know, about a year ago, 
One of the tasks that I knew I would encounter would be to support individuals and families during the loss of loved ones. And this week, with the passing of my friend, Ms. Rhonda Longbowers, I mentioned her earlier, it marked the 11th death during the last year for which I've been able to support, I've had the honor to support individuals and families. For what I thought was going to be a cause of anxiety, and quite honestly, I was afraid of the task, it's turned out into a source of blessing beyond measure. And I don't say that in any type of prideful way, but I do thank the Lord God for enabling me to overcome that feeling of anxiety. I also thank him for equipping me to walk with these individuals and families during their grief while also helping them celebrate the lives of their loved ones. Through our trials, adversity, suffering, and life experiences, we can learn obedience as well. Like the high priest who was put in charge of the things that relate to God, if we are obedient, then the Lord God will order our steps and make us ready, or another word we can say, he will consecrate us. He will make us ready to do the work that he wants to accomplish in and through us. <clears throat> so what is your source of anxiety? If you are experiencing anxiety or worry because God is laying something on your heart or calling you to accomplish some task, I want you to be encouraged. I encourage you to step out in faith and be willing and open to allow the Lord God to work in and through you. If you believe that calling is something for which we can support as a church or a charge, then I would love to have a conversation. And let's discern how God might use us together. If your anxiety or worry is caused by a life circumstance or other situation, I want you to hear this. In relation to the Lord God, I've heard it said, Oh, God won't put anything on us more than we can handle. But my friends, that is not found in Scripture. That is a misconception. And, but I'm gonna, we're going to uh, clear that up. The Scripture for which that points is as follows. This is from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. He says, No testing has overtaken you. That is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. So did you hear that? The scripture said, but with the testing, he, meaning the Lord God, will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. So what I've realized is that it's not about what we can handle, but it's about us trusting the Lord Jesus Christ to handle our difficulties and giving our burdens over to him, allowing us to endure our circumstances, but with his help. He wants us to depend on him, which of course increases our faith, and it strengthens our relationship. So I'd like to give you some steps that you can take to overcome anxiety. Is anybody listening? Say amen. Amen. Okay. So, if prayer and meditation are not a part of your daily routine, then I want to encourage you to find a consistent time when you are thanking the Lord God for his many blessings, but also surrendering your worries to him. Don't forget how God's creation might play a part in your prayer and meditation time. So that's number one, prayer and meditation. Number two, we can share our burdens with one another. We are not called to go through this life alone, y'all. Let us help us, let us help carry our load. The Apostle James tells us in chapter 5, beginning with a verse, he says, verse 16, he says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. The earnest prayer of a righteous person, so we should be praying and lifting one another, which we do. I've already said, if I don't need prayers, I'm going to be on Paula's list, right? Yes. So just to recap, make sure that you're making time for prayer and meditation. Uh, it can be the most rewarding minutes of the day, and I believe it sets the stage for the day. There, there have been times when I have it, and oh boy, it seems like things go all wonky, and so, yeah, I just have to make sure I'm setting that stage for that day. So, prayer and meditation, set the stage for your day, share your burdens with one another, and lastly, the third step, engage in acts of service to shift the focus from self, from me, to we. From serving from self to others. Remember how Jesus spoke about shifting from that me mindset to we practice of service? The Lord God is still in control. Remember how he cared for the sparrows and knows the numbers on our head, right? Jesus knows the pain we bear. 
Don't let anxiety be the end of our faith, but let's let our faith end anxiety and worry. Let's be open to the Lord God's call to servanthood and let me know how I can help you with that. I offer these words in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.